Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the National Building Museum. Uh, my name is Scott Kratz. I'm the Vice President for Education here at the museum. And tonight, we are presenting a program entitled Greening the Supply Chain as part of our series, For the Greener Good, Conversations That Will Change the World. Many of us want to choose sustainable products, but how do we know what is really green? For building supplies that are manufactured overseas, how do we measure the impact of the, on the environment, the carbon miles traveled, or if any toxic materials were used? And how are we defining green anyway? Is it doing no damage to the environment? Is it measuring greenhouse gases? Or is it man manufacturing products in a socially responsible manner? How do architects, contractors, engineers, and consumers avoid bogus claims that might be perceived as greenwashing? These are some of the topics that we'll be discussing this evening, um, and we have pulled together an impressive panel representing a range of backgrounds and disciplines. I look forward to an in-depth and fascinating discussion as part of our series. And this For the Greener Good series is presented by the museum's sustainability partner, the Home Depot Foundation, and we would like to thank them for their generous support of this innovative lecture series. And programs such as tonight are geared to make sure that we're engaging you, the audience, um, in the discussions and capturing your um, questions and thoughts. Um, we will break periodically during the program to take questions from you all. And um, before we begin, just so we have the panel itself has an idea of who is in the audience, um, the, can you raise your hands if there's architects in the audience? Architect, architects, that's great. Planners, wonderful. Um, landscape architects. Great. Engineers? Wonderful. Um, students? Good. Um, federal or state employees? Great. Um, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, before we begin tonight, um, one plug for next week's, or next week, excuse me, next month's For the Greener Good program. Um, the, on April 29th, we will hold a panel looking at sustainable schools with representatives from the U.S. Department of Education, the Center for Disease Control, uh, the moderator will be the health policy correspondent for National Public Radio, and a representative from the design firm Perkins & Will. Now let me give the quickest of introductions for everyone so we can get right into um, the discussion and presentations. Gwen David O has worked over a decade in international business with a concentration on collaboration with non-government organizations focusing on international development. In her current capacity as Senior Director of Corporate Programs and Operations for the World Environmental Center, she manages several membership-based projects such as the Greening the Supply Chain initiatives. She oversees regional activities in Latin America, including their current State Department funded project in Guatemala in El Salvador, on increasing the efficiency of local businesses by implementing environmental improvements, and the Pfizer funded Maya Rainforest Conservation Project in collaboration with the Rainforest Alliance and the Nature Conservancy. Nadav Malin is Vice President of Building Green, LLC, and serves as editor of Environmental Building News, a monthly newsletter on environmentally responsible design and construction, and co-editor of the Green Spec Product Directory. He is chair of the Materials and Resources Technical Advisory Group for the U.S. Green Building Council's LEED rating system. He's a LEED faculty member and a LEED accredited professional. He was a principal author of the Applications Report for the Environmental Resource Guide that compares the environmental value of different building materials in various applications. He also served on the U.S. team for the Green Building Challenge, uh, manages the U.S. Department of Energy's High Performance Buildings Database Project, and leads the content development team for web and software resources at buildinggreen.com. Kirsten Ritchie is the Principal Director of Sustainable Design for the Asia Pacific Region for Gensler, a global architecture and design firm. In this role, she serves as one of the firm's leading sustainability ambassadors, engaging staff, clients, and the public on innovative and sustainable design, construction, and operational thinking. Uh, a lead AP uh, and licensed professional engineer, she has more than 25 years experience in various aspects of high performance building design and operations, green product certifications, environmental cleanup, business intelligence technology, and sustainable infrastructure. She's very active in a wide range of sustainable standards development organizations such as USGBC, the Collaborative for High Performance Schools, NSF uh, International, and ASTM. She was an early proponent for the use of internet technology to facilitate sustainable behavior, and she created one of the first online green product catalogs, the Eco Living Sourcebook, that premiered on the web in 1996. As a frequent beta tester and early product adopter, she continued to pursue and promote the possibilities and opportunities for digital technology to reduce the global environmental footprint of human behavior. 
And our moderator this evening um, will be Kenneth Langer. Ken is president of the Architectural Energy Corporation, or AEC, a leading energy and environmental engineering firm that helps clients achieve and maintain peak performance and sustainable practices in new and existing buildings. It also provides program management and product development services to a wide range of utility, government, industry, and institutional clients. Um, they were founded in 1982. It was acquired um, by the Carrier Corporation, a United Technologies company, in 2008. In 2009, AEC merged uh, with EMSI, an international green building consulting company found, founded by Dr. Langer, um, which continues to operate as an independent company in China. Um, from 2000 to 2009, he built um, EMSI into one of the top international consulting firms specializing in the design of green buildings in sustainable communities. Um, they pioneered the green building industry in China, and its products include the country's first LEED certified office buildings, shopping malls, factories, commercial interior projects, and sustainable communities. Um, the um, EMSI China was the lead consultant for the Beijing 2008 Olympic Village and is currently working on the 2010 Expo Center for the World Expo in Shanghai. Um, we're taking a little break from um, the, our, um, the um, standard operations for um, the, for the Green and Good series. We're going to have a series of very brief, no more than five minute presentations from each of the panelists. Um, the, and then we'll all convene up here um, on stage for a discussion breaking periodically um, from Q&A with you all. And we'll start with Kirsten Ritchie. Good evening all. Um, so of course I work for an architectural firm and uh, we had the choice of doing PowerPoint or not doing PowerPoint, but given that I do work for a design firm and we do have a lot of great eye candy, I said, okay, we're gonna do PowerPoint. Um, so these are some of the samples of our projects. But what I am wanted to give you some quick facts, and why do I have, there we go. Some quick facts about Gensler. We probably, many of you have heard about it, but just so you know, again, we were established back in 1965. We are an employee-owned firm. Um, we have about 35 offices w worldwide, um, including majority here in North America, but we are also in Europe we are, and, uh, and the Far East. Um, we work in 19 different practice areas, and I'll give you a little brief talk about that. We have 930 lead accredited professionals on staff. Um, we touch about 300 million square feet of building product a year. So it's part of the reason really, if you can imagine the buying power of that, but also the buying responsibility of all that material. Um, and we'll get into some of those details during the course of this evening. Um, of, of that 300 million, about 45 million square feet are lead certified or registered projects. So we have a very, 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 very large lead portfolio that we are um, moving forward. We are first and foremost a design firm, but we also feel very strong in the power of design to transform organizations and to improve people's lives. And that's really what we're talking about when we talk about green sustainable design. How do we transform organizations and how do we improve people's lives? Again, 18 different practice areas. We work in airports. We work in brand design. We work in commercial office buildings. Of course, that's one of our big core. We also do a growing amount in the area of consulting and strategic consulting and analysis of, of the use of real estate. Um, we do planning and urban design. We do product design. About the only building type that we don't do, we don't do hospitals, we don't do prisons, and we try and stay away from condos. Um, but everything else, we're, we like to, to play in. Um, the scale of our projects really vary enormously, um, anywhere from a six centimeter wine label to the 600 meter tower that we're building and designing in Shanghai. So it's, it's an enormous scale of the kind of work that we do, um, which needs to say being a director of sustainable design for that region or for a region in Gensler, um, just, you know, how do you grapple with that and how do you really set strategy that helps to make sure that you are doing green and right and the right thing from your projects. More specifically in the commercial office space, which is an area that we do play very significantly. This is one of the things, I'm being an engineer, I'm very much metric oriented because when we measure it, that means we can manage it. And if we manage it, we can improve it. So let's measure it. And we did an analysis and you look at the typical uh, square foot of office space in the United States um, back in 2008, basically resulted in the consumption of about 85,000 BTUs of power generating 28 pounds of CO2, consuming 365 gallons of water. At the same point in time, workplace satisfaction with that space was only running about 64%. I don't know about you, but my prof said 64, that's an F. I think we need to work on this. And even more, when you think about from a utilization perspective, we always talk typical utilization, maybe 40, 50%, but that's eight to five, um, Monday through Friday. The reality is that space is sitting there needing to be conditioned using materials much more than eight to five, and you factor that in, you suddenly realize you're using all this stuff, and you only have a 17% utilization rate. So there's a lot of things that we really need to be doing to smarten up our use of space. 
Um, so yes, how about you spend a little less time studying how my generation destroyed the environment and more time figuring out the magical solution. Now whether this is your dad and you're the daughter or whether it's your uncle, in my case, my uncle and I'm the niece, you know, yes, I'm all about trying to figure out magical solutions, but I do think that there are also some non-magical solutions that we can move forward with. So I wanted to give you kind of five key, what I see are five key concepts and help you to set some green priorities for thinking during the course of this evening. First, um, alluded to it, less space, less stuff used more intensively. This is a quote actually from Kevin Campshire with GSA, um, and he's now actually the acting head of the high performance um, office buildings. So what does, to give you an example of one of our clients, HP has gone aggressively on this program. They're not losing staff, but they're definitely consolidating space. By, they had an old building that was 451,000 square feet. They've consolidated their operations down to 165,000 square feet in that. There was a 6% reduction in headcount. They did have some reduction in headcount, but it was a 40% cost reduction, and it was a 63% reduction in area and basically, in essence, keeping the same staff. You're going to see more and more and more of this. Now, those of you who are wanting to build new buildings, this may be disconcerting because it's going to be a lot of space that's out there that we need to fill up. Um, but for those of you that are on the interior design side, this is lots of opportunity. So, you know? Um, number two, I think it's really important that we always work to continually innovate to achieve carbon neutrality or continually innovate for everything, but particularly when it comes to carbon. Um, and so, you know, the, the reality is we need to figure out how to kick our CO2 habit. And whether it's from energy security or whether it's from risk mitigation or whether it's from, you know, climate change in overall impacts, we have to be smart and we have to get CO2 out of our building, um, our building stock, our real estate solutions. This is something that's very interesting. It was a study that was done by McKinsey where it looked at the carbon footprint um, as well as other key factors for cities. Um, and you can take, kind of quickly take a look. We're happy to share the presentation. Um, but where, you can, where we'll be able to start, look and analyze and what are the different impacts from different supply, different materials, steel, concrete, concrete that's made with cement versus slag, um, and really starting to be able to figure out what, you know, what are the impacts and trying to then, then use that to select the smart materials, um, hopefully ones, of course, that are, are lower carbon footprint. Number three, we, there, there really is a big trend we're seeing more and more and more, and that is to build at the manufacturing plant and just assemble at the job site. One of the big reasons for that, if you look at you know, the landfills that we have in the United States, 40% of the waste that goes in those landfills continues to be waste from construction and demolition activities. It's the built environment that's going in there, not ongoing operations. We have to be a lot smarter about material usage when it comes to construction or you know, fit out interiors. Um, and one of the best ways to do that, we are much better at managing our materials when we do it in manufacturing plant than we are when we do it on a construction site. So I think you're going to be big trends. An interesting project that's happened in the UK, Travel Lodge. Yes, I know it's not a five-star, but a very practical building. Um, and this was actually built where they built on-site. They did a steel frame, but all the rooms are pods. They were manufactured off-site. They came in. They're basically slotting shipping containers into this building and building it up very efficient from a materials perspective. When you think about all the fixed, the finishes that go inside the hotel operation, very, very clean, very smart, significantly reduced the waste um, and the materials that were used to construct this building because of that strategy. Um, number four, this is a real big thing. Sustainability does not equal austerity. It's not the moral imperative. It is great, it's abundance, it's beautiful, and we always have to think about that. Um, and so here's one of the examples. This is an airport that we just recently finished in San Jose, California, the Midas, um, San Jose International Airport. I think that you would agree that's not you know, totally a boring sort of um, airport, and it's been designed with a um, number of sustainable design features um, uh, inside. You have wood, yes, wood in an airport, but actually this is something that's really interesting. We took a wood veneer, as an FSC certified veneer, um, low UF, um, or actually no UF adhesive, applied to a very, very thin but very strong um, uh, stainless or steel member that we were able to put up this along the wall. So you have this beautiful feature, aesthetically very pleasing, um, and yet minimal materials and minimal structure because if we did that thing in wood, it would be weighing, it would weigh a ton and require some real big, or large structure around it. The other thing too is if you notice we have a big swoopy area and traditionally what you'd be doing is you'd be, you'd be conditioning all that airspace. We brought the airspace down. We're doing displacement ventilation down at the passenger level. So we significantly reduced energy consumption for heating and cooling in that building. So those are the smart strategies that one can do, that one needs to do in order to develop um, projects which are sustainable and achieve the aesthetic that we all want to have when we're spending all these resources. And five, uh, if you don't ask 
they won't tell. This is a variation on the theme, don't ask, don't tell. The reality is, if you don't ask, they aren't going to tell. So you can pretend, I really love this chair, and I just know if I ask the question that I'm going to find out. There's all kinds of things I don't want to know about the fabric, so I'm just not going to say anything. I'm not going to ask. You need to ask. Don't be the ostrich whose head is in the stand. Don't, you know, ask the questions because you need to get the information. Only when you have the information can you make the right choices. So that's it. For those of you who want to follow me on Twitter, there I am. I'm Nadav Malin. I didn't prepare such a great flashy presentation. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, Building Green and what it is we do and um, so talk a little bit about how we think about products in that context. Um, we are a green building information uh, business. We've been doing this since 1992. We started the first issues of Environmental Building News. And um, we actually started doing a green product directly around, around 1996 as well, but we hadn't heard of the Internet yet then. So as usual, we're way behind Kirsten. Um, more recently, both the newsletter and, and our product directory are available online as part of buildinggreen.com. And focusing on that product directory here, because that's what we're talking about tonight, um, it's called GreenSpec. And GreenSpec is a vetted directory. We, we use an editorial review process to determine products that we feel belong in the directory. Um, it's not a certification program. Um, we don't publish reference standards. And the, the way we're able to get away with, essentially, publishing a directory that's just based on our, our editorial judgment is that we don't carry any advertising. So we have no incentive to, uh, to be pushed around one way or another. We basically just put in the products that we like. Um, we do have a process that we use, however, in choosing those products, and we're happy to share that process with anyone who asks. And so there's a series of criteria that we look for. And um, the, the main point I want to make here is that while we look for all these criteria, it's not a simple checklist approach where if something has one of those items, it's automatically in. Or if it doesn't, you know, if it has a bad quality, it's automatically out. We use a critical assessment process, and we're always um, applying this life cycle thinking. We're looking over the whole life cycle of the product, and we're trying to, to do a comprehensive balanced assessment of on balance, do the positives outweigh the negatives? Does this product meet our standards for one of the greatest, greenest products in its category and therefore um, one that should be included? And so we, do, we really do this assessment on a section-by-section on -section basis. So we look at, at windows and we make judgments about what are the greenest windows available. We look at carpeting, we look at flooring, things like that, and, and do that kind of assessment. And that's how we create the directory. Um, and online, it looks something like this. You can see a category, paints and coatings. You can see the connections um, to the related lead credits because so many people in the buildings industry are looking, looking for this information in the lead context. Um, you can see a quick overview into how we look at, at that category as a whole and then the products that we've chosen to include in the directory. And since I mentioned lead, I'm going to also just quickly mention our, uh, we have a new website as well called Lead User that is specifically oriented around helping teams through the lead process, through getting lead um, projects certified in the program. And one of the things we've been able to do is bring that same product directory into the Lead User as well so you can see the same lists of products. We bring them across in, into this other website. So we have essentially the same vetting information showing up in print, showing up on, on different websites and uh, multiple ways to share that around. So um, I'm going to leave it at that and look forward to talking more about the thinking behind this as we get together. Hi, I'm Gwen David out with the World Environment Center. And uh, I thought I did some really cool things and had a great job until I saw Kirsten's presentation. I'm seriously questioning my career choices now. Um, but uh, first, before we begin, or before I begin, I'd like to thank the National Building Museum and Home Depot Foundation for um, having this series. I actually live in D.C., so I've gone to the Greener Good series, and I think it's a very valuable discussion to have on a variety of topics. So uh, thank you for having the series, and thank you for having us participate in one of them, because uh, green supply chains is definitely of interest to me. My uh, organization is the World Environment Center. We're an international nonprofit based here in D.C., but we have offices in Germany, Latin America, and China. Our membership is made up of the largest, some of the mo largest multinationals in the world. We have a membership base of anywhere from 40 to 50 companies at any given time. And our mission is to work with them to advance sustainable development through their business operations and practices and strategies as well as the operations of their supply chains. 
Uh, we do this with them and in partnership with uh, governments, um, multilateral organizations, other nonprofits, and a range of stakeholders. One of the unique factors about WEC is that although our program is global in scope, we apply a very local, customized, um, on-the-ground solution to every one of our projects. Uh, they carry the WEC template but we uh, ensure that everything that we do is, um, speaks to exactly the supply chain that we're working with or the industrial association or, uh, in some cases, a few companies with just five employees. And uh, what makes that special is that we are able to really speak to um, sustainable development um, by focusing on results. The main project in our canon of projects is our greening the supply chain efforts. And what we, what we do, what our template is really, is to go into um, developing nations for the most part and access small and medium enterprises, which in our lingo is SMEs. And uh, we access them through the channels of our, for the most part, our, our members. And we use their supply chains. We get to their local SMEs and with encouragement from their customer, being the multinational, we work with them to uh, apply technologies and methodologies that encourage not just environmental benefits, mainly through cleaner production and energy efficiency practices, but also result in economic efficiencies. Uh, so they are encouraged to continue doing this. Uh, currently, this project, this greening supply chain project, we have operational in four countries in Latin America and uh, China, China being our biggest project right now. And uh, we're actually about to just launch with Coca-Cola, which is one of our members, and several of their suppliers in um, Costa Rica, which is nice work if you can get it. Um, this work is actually funded by the State Department. Sometimes the members fund it, sometimes the governments fund it. Uh, but what I hope will be, I'll be able to bring from the WEC pr perspective to this panel is the idea of um, what happens when you need to mix corporate incentives with uh, green supply chains. So with that, uh, I'll leave it and I'll uh, thank everybody for coming. And uh, I think we go to rearranging the chairs now. Yeah. Okay. How can you tell if a piece of lumber or a CFL light bulb mm -hmm. or a bamboo flooring is really green? You know, we've heard that there's environmental criteria, there's carbon footprint, there's manufacturing things in a socially responsible manner, durability, life cycle impact, VOC, so many different criteria. And I would think that, you know, beauty is sort of in the eye of the beholder. You know, if, to a person who's interested in climate, you know, the carbon footprint might be the, 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 the overriding concern to a person who is a hosp building a hospital, it's going to be toxicity. So how do you sort it all out? And I'm going to start here with, with Nadav because of his green spec expertise. Um, well, I guess my answer would be I, I don't think you do try to get to one, one particular answer. I think it's actually better if you have a level of information where the hospital designer can choose the least toxic product and the, the climate change person, the person who's more concerned about climate change can focus on the carbon footprint. And if you have that level of information about products, which is rare, unfortunately, but when you do have that level of information and you can make those value judgments based on, um, based on your own values and, and choose the products that fit your, fit your priorities, I think, I think that's actually a fine goal. And um, this idea that somehow um, you can just you know, there's, there's some sort of a binary, this is a green product and this isn't, um, even though in a way that, that's kind of what we end up doing with our directory. We do it, we cringe and hold our nose while we do it because um, ultimately things are always more complicated, more nuanced than that. Mm -hmm. And so in addition to um, choosing what does and doesn't go in the directory, we always tell a little story about why we put it in there. And sometimes even some of the things that are in there, we say, oh, but don't use it like this, right? Like there's a recycled uh, rubber flooring, right? Some of those recycled rubber flooring product, products are great outdoors or in really well ventilated, um, you know, spaces. But if you're going to bring that into uh, a daycare center, um, some of that the recycled tire really off gases a lot of toxic stuff. And so, even though it's again great from a waste management point of view, it's a great recycled content material. You want to be careful about using it indoors in a in a place that isn't ventilated well or 
where kids are going to be right next to it. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of something that, you know, where there's a trade-off. And, and it's not just, I guess I would leave with this thought, it's not just about choosing the right product. It's about how you use it. And the right product in one application may not be the right product in another one. Do you give more weight to some of these features than others? Or, I mean, how do, how do you put it yeah. all together? Um, we do, and the, the, um, the weight is something, when I mentioned in my introduction, we sort of look category by category at what the key issues are. And we make our assessments based on having analyzed that category and looked at what is it you want to pay attention to for this particular category. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about a piece of equipment, a car or a, a chiller or a, a boiler for a building, um, energy use is going to be the primary driver. And if that's not a very energy efficient piece of equipment, nothing else you can tell me about it is going to matter. It's going to have to be energy efficient first. Everything else, if you're comparing two similarly efficient pieces, mm -hmm. well, then maybe you get into some of the secondary considerations. Right, Kirsten? Yeah, I would definitely agree. I mean, I think, you know, number one rule, though, from that perspective is a single, at, single green attribute does not a sustainable product make. So things that only claim, you know, I've got 5% recycled content, therefore I'm green and wonderful, it looks like that's the first kind of flag, I'd say, because you, you really want people to look holistically across, you um, know, all the different impact areas that you potentially have from a product. You also want to make sure that the product is addressing what is of concern in that particular category. So, for example, lighting fixtures, the really important thing is how efficient are these and how efficient are they at actually also delivering the light quality um, that, is that, that you want for that environment. So if... if the manufacturer is not addressing either of those. That's a big gaping hole. Um, you also have to look for those things. It's like, are, you know, I'm, am I being led down a, 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 some sort of path? I saw the other day. Actually, it was in a, it was in a green bill brochure. Seven points for buying our stormwater tank. Um, you know, the lead points are buying the stormwater tank. And it's like, well, yes, okay, stormwater harvesting is great, but there's a lot of other stuff that goes into that in order to get even close to getting the seven points. Um, and so why are you, you know, why, why, why are you raising that particular aspect? Um, or the other one my husband did bring home from me one day from a, um, a, a hardware store. I love this, a mouse trap. You know, the ones that snap the backs and kill the mice, right? FSC certified wood. And you're like, <laughs> I'm wondering if there's a little bit of a disconnect here. Um, you know, appreciated that they went after that. They did that. So it's really thinking about holistically what, what, what should this product be addressing. You also um, the mouse cares. Yeah, the mouse cares. You know, it's got to be a way. I just, you know, I don't mind mouse. I just don't want them in my house. You know, I'm looking for that thing that just keeps them away. Same with ants. So or, or, I guess that extends to organic poison, right? Right. But, uh. <laughs> but it is really important that you think holistically. And I think, you know, the... Um, Actually, I mean, sorry, oh, I'm going to interrupt you just with another anecdote because that whole thing about you like the mice but you don't want them uh -huh. in your house, I think there's a really interesting question that we run into a lot with, with green building, which is, how much are we actually comfortable coexisting with other ecosystems? Mm -hmm. And a specific area where it comes up is if you're going to choose wool carpet and do you want that moth-proofed or not? Right. Because there were some designers that went out of their way to get carpet without moth-proofing because they didn't want that mm -hmm. toxic chemical in their building, and they got moths. Mm -hmm. you know, so <laughs> um, you know, how we, part of this is about how comfortable are we with really you know, what aspects of, of other ecosystems, other species do we want to live with, and how closely. Right. And Very interesting. Part of that trade Gwen, Gwen bring, you bring a different perspective, right. not being necessarily in the building, looking only at the building industry, but the supply chain of companies that are manufacturing cars or, right. or other kinds of materials. So do you have a different perspective on this? Well, actually, I'm going to echo a bit of what uh, Kirsten says about it needing to be holistic. And mm -hmm. one, of, um, one of the gentlemen that we work with in a company, and I'm... For the most part, I'm not going to name any of these companies, but one of the companies, he's a marketer, and he said it's the GF, G E F Y, which is green enough for you, which is <laughs> basically any consumer will have, will purchase something when it's green enough for them, and that can be uh, different for every consumer. Uh, and so the way we see it, and when we work with our companies, is that we're looking at what is controllable on the other end. Um, and we're, we're kind of the cradle to gate in terms of we're the ones that um, look at a, a company can control what they produce and what their suppliers produce and maybe what their suppliers' suppliers produce. To be honest, they can't control it that much, but that's what they're trying to do with their cor corporate footprint as, we're all, as we all become more aware of the fact that it's not just a company but who they purchase from and what they make. We have to go um, back further up the stream and uh, so the consumer 
can care whether or not there are VOCs in your product or that VOCs were created in your product or what the off-gases were or whatever, or they can just think that it looks pretty. But on the production side, um, there is definitely ways to think that a product is green, and it changes for each manufacturer, of course, and that's not even within... You know, it's not even, it doesn't even change within an industry. It changes within the manufacturers of the industries and the suppliers to that manufacturer. Um, and I think that you know, leads mm -hmm. to the larger question of um, how do you, what do you wind up having to cherry pick what your criteria are? Um, what do you certify on? And, right. and getting, you know, kind of geeking out on, on that level of, a, of um, the back end of what makes a product green. Uh, because that part is what, that's the space I'm comfortable with, and that's actually the space a lot of manufacturers are comfortable with because that's what they control. Whether a consumer uses it properly or cares that it's green is, is really still a question that isn't, um, isn't fully answered. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not fully explored and it's not fully answered. Mm -hmm. Ken, if I can also yeah, fall a little bit more on that. I mean, one of the things that we really are trying to encourage moving away, we've certainly seen a lot of, you know, particularly in the building space, where manufacturers have moved to say, okay, well, there's this lead checklist and it talks about different material attributes. And so, therefore, that gives us kind of a short running list of what we should be looking at. We are always approached by, you know, clients, by, by manufacturers saying, okay, tell me, you know, what is, how, how, how far green do I have to take this in order to make you happy? And my pushback to them is saying, I want you to look holistically at your products. And I, you know, there's, there's an involving science, there's life cycle assessment. Um, what we have it, from a standards perspective is what are known as environmental product declarations, where you're actually reporting out the impacts of your products. You're not saying good, bad, or ugly. You're just reporting out what is, using life cycle from a, as, as an assessment methodology in terms of your carbon footprint, in terms of water consumption, in terms of waste generation, in terms of toxic, toxicity. Not saying good, bad, or ugly, just saying here's what it is. Once you have that base map, you can then make very smart decisions as a manufacturer to how to reduce those impacts. But until you make that investment um, and, and do that step, you're just grabbing at straws and you're not laying out a strategic foundation for improving the, your product. So I think that's, from our perspective, one of the things that we're really trying to do with our manufacturers is say, you need to go do this. You need to do a life cycle assessment, a rigorous assessment, an environmental product declaration. It gives you the base, you know, your roadmap. Then you, from there, you're going to be able to show continuous improvements and be able to justify why you've made them, um, both from an environmental perspective as well, probably from an economic perspective. Mm -hmm. So but I think that's one of the things that we really want to see. Even, even companies that really put a lot of effort into do, and to do that, run up against questions, value judgments that are really hard to answer. I, mean, I think, you know, I'm sure you're very familiar with the story of interface flooring. Oh, yeah. I mean, does as much LCA as mm -hmm. probably anybody and right. really analyzes this stuff to the end. Right. And they've determined that um, the PVC backing is something they, they want, they're going to keep using well, and for so the time I, being. But at least you and know other why other people are, aren't comfortable with that. Right. But at least you know why you're doing that. I mean, that's what it shows you is one of those things a lot of people don't want to get into that debate, but you have PVC is a great example of it where you can, you know, there's the toxicity part that can actually, there you focus more on the, getting rid of the phthalates and the stabilizers, and that's something they can do. But if you, what you want to replace it with other materials that are much more energy intensive and generate much higher carbon footprint and don't last as long, you know, you've got some of the science there that says, here's why we're doing this, until that material comes up, because that's the other problem that we have is this willy-nilly, well, don't use this, so you substitute with something else, and it turns out to be worse. They're doing that with brake pads now in Europe, where they're take, they've taken out asbestos because it's bad, and they're putting in antimony, you know, and the, the friable antimony is a whole lot worse for us than asbestos, so why are they making that substitution? So if you have that basic, you know, scientific rigor, it's not perfect, but if you have that, that road map, I mean, that starting place, then you can make a much better, you know, road map on how to get to your destination. But as a consumer, how do you do the math? Oh, I mean, well, yeah. what I'm always struggling <laughs> with is, okay, you've got a product, and, and there's so many factors from, you know, the time it's, the, it's extracted, the materials are extracted, and then they go into the product, and there's transportation, and there's this and that, and then there's the product itself and its efficiency, and then there's the end of life. And before you know it, you need more P in my mind, PhDs hovering around this thing than there are clay warriors over at the National Geographic Museum. I mean, y y there must be a simpler way. Well, the reality is, is that there will come a point in time when we as consumers don't have to make any of those decisions because whatever we buy out there is just the right thing because it's 
green, it's sustainable, it's supportable. Now, that's not going to happen in my lifetime. I'm not really worried about it. But, you know, that's where we want it to go. There is a huge challenge from the quality of information and, and what you need to have and how it gets related to the consumer to allow them to make quick judgments. Um, and we have this problem. You look at our hospitality product projects, where there are 10,000 line items that we're purchasing. There is no way our designers are going to be able to go and ask all these kinds of questions for every single finish that they put on it, you know, on, on chairs or on headboards or whatever. So we have to have much smarter ways to translate that technical environmental information to. Um, decision-making decision tools, whether it's done through branding, through identity, through standards that allow people to very quickly say, okay, at least you're on the short list, and I know that you're moving in the right direction. Um, and, you know, it's having things like, um, like Building Green. It's some of the certification programs that are out there now that are taking all this complex life cycle information and, you know, narrowing it down to level one, two, or three, or green-rated building, you know, or, or whatever. My 14-year-old daughter tells me that her iPod has an app now that's called Green Good, Green Good or Green Goods, where you can actually find, uh, you know, the greenest uh, item uh, of, you know, in a particular area. And they've searched through, I don't know, six zillion databases and, and put in all these factors. I mean, is there anything like that for the construction? Well, I mean, I guess green spec comes as close, where you don't, if people don't want to be an expert in this whole thing. They just want to be doing the right thing and drinking wine at night. You know? I, mean, <laughs> I like that. I mean, <laughs> how, how can we do this without all having to, to, to go crazy? Is that organic well, wine, I hope? It's organic, organic wine. <laughs> Gwen. I wanted to point out that uh, we, we recently, in the fall, did a roundtable with uh, several of our members and other companies, uh, companies like IBM, BASF, uh, Pitney Bowes, um, uh, Boehringer Engelheim, basically, across uh, sectors. Uh, and the title of the roundtable, these were chief sustainability officers, and the title of the roundtable was Green Marketing and Design. And um, this question came up, and, and one of the conclusions that I won't say everybody agreed with, but really was kind of a, a more or less general consensus, is that what you want, again, um, in agreement with what you're saying, is it, it needs to be... Um, part of the product. In, in other words, it, it shouldn't be the niche that it's a green product and then the consumer has to know exactly what um, they're looking for, whether it's shade-grown coffee or coffee, you know, I mean, coffee just in, in and of itself has, you know, 5,000 ways that it can save the world and if it did all of it, <laughs> it would be covered with all those stickers that you see at Starbucks or any of the other coffee shops. Um, Instead, it needs to be endemic in the product. And an example is, is, for example, with cars. Safety wasn't always, when cars first came out, safety wasn't always the, um, safety was a luxury in cars. And now safety is assumed to be part of the car. You don't get a car if it is unsafe. You don't make a car if... <laughs> That's what we thought until well, about three right. months ago, but anyway. <laughs> um, they're not one of our members. Okay. <laughs> I was afraid to ask. <laughs> you don't get a car if it's unsafe ostensibly, if you know it's not, if you know it's unsafe. And, and certainly you can buy cars that have greater safety features to it, and that is a luxury and that's a niche market but you assume that there is a level of safety. The goal should be that products, uh, there, is a presum there is a presumption that there is a level of green in the product, and we're not there yet, but you can't um, expect the customer, the consumer, the end user to be able to um, go through all of the things that you have to go through. I mean, imagine if you had to um, go through the list, and when you're buying your uh, SUV or, or your smart car, whatever it is, to check and see if there are the number of seatbelts that you want. You know, this is, these, are, these are basics that you have to assume, and that's really where I think a lot of the industry in, in various sectors want the products to go, that they're going to do this regardless, just because that's where it has to go, and the consumer can kind of presume a basic level of green. 
Yeah, I mean, you bring up a really good point. If you look at how come we got like the electrical standards that happened, to, you know, was triggered by the big Chicago fire, right? In terms of the World's Fair, so we, we have those electric safety standards, and then we started to get a little bit, you know, on the manufacturing side, certain standards relative to air quality from manufacturer release, but not about the product. We really don't have those base performance standards like we do. Even if you talk about furniture, there are standards for you know, what kind of weight it supports. So that if I sit on it, it does, I don't go immediately to the floor. We don't have those base standards on the environmental side, um, except for maybe gross toxicity. You know, when you well, except where something. you live in California. Well, in California, we're having more now <laughs> because you do have that. We have, you know, whether it's the um, formaldehyde releases from particle board. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, the whole look at, at bromated flame retardants. We have a number of things that are starting to happen. So that's starting to drive the industry. Um, but we really don't have those kind of standards that say, hey, you manufacturer need to be s smart about the material optimization of, of the product. Um, you know, that's the reality is, I mean, it, when one of the things that's really bad is where people actually heavyweight a product to put recycled content in it. You know, really want the lightweighting of the product. So, you know, the, how, how, we, how we start to pull out that, that body of standards such, you know, there's the base performance, and then there's always that thing above, like the consumer reports, where, okay, I know I buy the car, I know it meets certain basic safety requirements to allow it to perform on the road, but then if I want to go above and beyond that, I've got, to, like, a consumer report. Is that, is that baseline that you're imagining we get to with green, is that going to have to be regulated? Because if it's not regulated, absolutely. then there's always going to be somebody trying to undercut on price and not do that? No, absolutely. I mean, when, uh, if you buy a stake, it's USDA certified, for example. I mean, you, you have to have some level of certification. I don't know if it's independent or if it's government regulated, but there does need to be some certification. Um, I mean, you, you, know, well, you can't trust everyone for their altruism, sure. But I was asking if specifically, I mean, some of these things we're talking about are voluntary, certi they're certified, but it's still, it's optional. Mm -hmm. And somebody can choose to buy the certified or the non-certified. Right. I'm wondering if to get to the level of ubiquity that you're talking about, it really doesn't, needs to be, like, like car safety is regulated. Right. You, don't, you, you don't have the option of buying a car without enough seatbelts. Right. right. I, I believe that's where it should go, and I believe that's where it eventually will go. I mean, but it, it'll, I think the, the, the devil is in the details. Are we going to do it by um, LCA? Are we going to do it by other standards? I mean, you know, the, is it going to differ for product? Is it going to differ for manufacturer, for industry? But, yeah, I do think there needs to be baseline, a certification of a baseline. If consumers had good information, like, you know, when you, you pick up your, your chips or whatever and you see the little label and it tells you how much salt and, and fat and this kind of fat and that kind of fat, and, you know, if you have that kind of information for building products or toothbrushes or whatever the heck it is, do you need to have it regulated? Why can't the consumer make his or her own choice based on good information? Okay, well, I'm just going to say that you want to have it, you at least want to have it certified. You at least want to know that what they're saying is, right. is correct. Right, there has to be some level of uh, third-party verification right. or whatever. But is, is that enough, or do we really need to go to a world where, where things are well, mandated? Well, I do believe on the food side, actually, it is regulated because it requires that you put those labels on the package, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you have to do that analysis. Right. So, so that just even that transparency of information right. is a first kind of legislative right. regulatory step that, that, right. that could be required. The big challenge that we have when we talk about anything in the building products or anything outside of food is what's the baseline? Everything in the, and food is normalized to 2,000 calories a day, which we even know for itself is you know, a real fallacy because you've got some people who may need... 800 calories a day. Me, I eat a lot more than that, but that's what I should be eating. Um, versus other people who can get, you know, who go for 4,000, 5,000 calories a day. Um, so th those baselines, and you think about the building products industry. I mean, you know, comparing a chair to a steel, you know, a steel membrane, they're going to be really different functions there. So that's one of the big challenges. Well, I think there's another important difference too in these. This reason why this example with food, what, what's regulated on there, what, what's in the nutrition label, is what's going to affect me as the person who eats the food. Right. right, and so I think it's appropriate that I should have have the information, but also have the choice. If I want to choose the unhealthier one, you know, I, I can do that. And with when we talk about green, it's more similar to an organic label, where essentially I'm I'm making a choice, but the impacts of my choice aren't just on me; they're on everybody. Mm -hmm. And so I think there it's a social there's a social compact that comes into question about how far do we as a society go, or as a whole global community, mm -hmm. go in saying well, actually, nobody should be making that stuff that's polluting the air, polluting the whole planet, because we're right. all affected. And, you know, that's where I think there's no easy answer, you know, in terms of where you draw that line, but I think it's, it, it's gradually getting, getting drawn and, and going up. The bar's going up a bit. 
Time flies when you're having fun. I promised Scott that we'd take a short break and have some questions in the middle. Is this the right time, Scott, to take a few questions? Uh, I'm Chin Yi Wong. I'm a you know, planner working in international development. But uh, I find it a little hard to talk about green in the supply chain without sort of talking more about, like, you know, maximize, like, as much as you can, like, close loop production, uh, like, local sourcing of materials, and then key trying to sort of minimize, like, the, the logistical or, you know, or transportation and whatnot between from, from one assembly plant to another. And so I'm just wondering if you guys can talk more about that and, see, and I want to see if there's a push for manufacturers to sort of get to um, get towards that. And I actually have a, another question, which is how does, is there a push towards, you know, you guys talked about um, thinking about things holistically. So, you know, there's lead, there's lead certified buildings and whatnot. So what's the current push towards, like, lead ND, for example, um, neighborhood development? Um, well, so. okay. Um, Gwen, do you want to take that first question about... I'd love uh, to. I didn't hear the first part, though. It's, um, are you talking about transportation logistics? I'm sorry. I couldn't well, hear. I mean, for example, like... Um, oh, that's better. Like, you know, there's this concept of eco-industrial park, and in, in an eco-industrial park you have, you know, um, you're producing a certain product, but, like, you're having the assembly of different components in, in like, a almost like a clustering of, uh, of, these, of these factories so that, right. you know, you minimize the... One person's waste, waste is the other the... person's input and all of that. Right, like right. minimizing, like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. transportation and, you know, carbon footprint in, in the supply chain by clustering many, uh, these assemblies, assembly sites of, of different components. Mm -hmm. So is that the answer? Is that one of the things that you guys I, are I trying to promote? I, and, I think it's... If it's actually possible to sort of uh, scale that up, scale that practice up a little bit. I think that's... I, I, it's a great idea. It's not something that is easily done, and certainly um, uh, on, the, on the level that we work, um, we... We go into companies, and our local experts will say things like, if you spend $5,000, you can buy a piece of equipment that will help you clean your water so you can reuse it for your glass washing, and then you'll save money. You'll save $10,000 to $20,000 in a year. We, we're not at the level where we suggest that people create a neighbor, an eco-neighborhood of manufacturing. I will say, however, that um, in Shanghai, the municipality has done this, and uh, in the area of Pudong, they have created these types of neighborhoods where um, the manufacturing um, is, a lot of it is shared, so they can, for example, load balance energy um, and electricity usage, uh, which is fantastic, and the irony is, is that, uh, you know, they create incentives for companies to go there uh, whether it's in old buildings that need to be retrofitted or to build new buildings, and they even have greater incentives for that, especially if you put, uh, if you consider um, green standards in the buildings. Um, and the irony is that they've, uh, this has been so successful in the specific area of Budong that they now don't have the infrastructure to support all of it, and they have to do an entirely new neighborhood on the other side of Shanghai, um, which is, you know, it's, I guess you're lucky if that's your problem. So, yeah, I think it's a great way to do it. I, I don't know if that can be driven from uh, consultants and experts saying it. I think there needs to be incentives, and, and specifically government incentives, municipal incentives, to, to create this level of um, encouragement. Uh, if, if you're not incentivized to do something like that, I'm not sure if the savings that you reap simply from being in... Um, that type of circular economy, if you will, is, is going to drive you to do it. Mm -hmm. We do have a very interesting case in California, the Sonoma Mountain Village, which is in the county of Sonoma. Um, it's being developed by Coddington Industries. And they've done basically that. They took, they took an old corporate campus um, and have modified it to have a lot of live work as well as um, small manufacturing industries that all integrated with one another. And they, you know, very supportive, both from an energy perspective, water consumption perspective, as well as the materials that come in and what, you know, some of the, uh, the waste products um, become the feedstock for, for other um, other industries, where, of course, it's really actually very strong is the manufacturing facility, actually artist community, because you're getting a lot of art product that, that's coming out of that. So we, we are, mm -hmm. you know, definitely seeing 
um, some of that. One of the things, too, I think that you alluded to, the whole issue of the distance, or, you know, the, kind of the distance that products travel um, and the impact. And, of course, there's the carbon footprint impact associated with things being far away. But from my perspective, one of the really important things and why you want to source materials locally is the jobs factor. Um, if you look at a typical building project, you know, probably about 50 percent of the, that project cost is in the materials. And if that's all coming from outside the community, that means all those jobs, that value is gone, is somewhere else. So that's something that we really need to be thinking smartly about is saying, okay, how do we do this? The challenge that we've had is the way our economic system works, it really it benefits going for fewer and bigger. And we, want, we need to go back to the distributed, you know, find a more and smaller um, for that perspective. I mean, for, in part for that reason. But and that's there's, a, a, there's a another, another perspective on that that I like because we, similarly to the point you were making about um, the fact that when you transport materials long distances from one place to another, there's, there's you know, pollution impacts of that. And um, we just sort of, this was quite a few years ago now, 10, 12 years ago, we kind of assume that that's a really big impact and that's going to show up as a big as a big piece of the life cycle. You know, when you do a whole life cycle assessment, that's going to be a really big piece. But when you run the numbers, for most products, it's actually not that big. Um, it turns out that if you look at the transportation impacts compared to the energy that goes into the manufacturing process or the feedstock energy in the materials themselves, the transportation tends to be a, a relatively small piece. But um, so I think the jobs factor that Kirsten was alluding to, or, or another reason I think it's really important to stay local when you can, is uh, I come from, from New England, and we have a lot of local woodlots. And so I have a very real example of if I'm buying wood for a, for a building I'm building, and the wood is coming from a woodlot in my community, and I can see exactly how those trees are harvested. I can see the impact on the forest of cutting down those trees. And I'm going to know if the logger did a bad job, if they're clear cut, or if the logger damaged some system. I'm going to have a direct connection to that. If the wood is coming from a thousand miles away, up in, in our area, probably come from eastern Canada, um, and I have no connection to that, then I don't have that, that direct engagement. So part of using local things is, is about a connection to place and sort of going back to a time when we actually understood not numerically, quantitatively, conceptually the life cycle, but actually experienced the life cycle of what we're using. Mm. I think that changes our decisions and our relationships to what uh, we use. Who else? I'd like to get some more questions, sir. Uh, I know, my question is about um, if there what the avenues of how we as you know consumers of these products and things like that can influence and obviously the you know the big one is with our wallets and that requires the information and transparency and the research that you guys covered in the very beginning of the of this presentation but are there are there any other avenues by which we can help this process and exert influence to you know to help tell these companies that yes you know what you're doing to Green your supply chain is is valuable to us, and and you know keep working towards those standards. So I have definitely have one helping in the development of the standards. Um, it really is rather unfortunate the lack of the design design community input we see in um, pro environmental product standards, whether they're going through NSF International or going through ASTM. Um, I sit on I chair the E6 the E60 committee on environmentally preferable products. Um, and we have, you know, I don't know, there's probably about 100 members of it or so now, and maybe there's four from the design profession that are there, um, which is really appalling. It's really hard. Um, and, I mean, we try and call more and more and more out, so that's one way. And, and to give you an idea of what we are up against, it's a standard. We've identified five major attributes that we think need to be um, incorporated. This is in part being driven by EPA of when you want to make a declaration that you have an environmentally preferable product. And we, you, we figure you have to address energy, you have to address water, you have to address carbon, you have to address materials, and you also have to address health, public and ecosystem health. Um, the last ballot that we went out, we got 450 negatives. We hold the record now for the most number of negatives ever, you know, f uh, filed on an ASTM standard, and it was all 95% of them were around the health issue. We have, you know, it's really difficult to get consensus, but we don't think that you can make a claim of having an environmentally preferable product if you don't deal with the toxicity and health issue. So we really need, and it's, it's hard work, it's, it requires, you know, it's intelligence, it's research, it's coming up with solutions. It's not, you can't just say, I don't like what you've written here. We need people that are coming to the table to say, okay, here's an alternative path, here's a way to go to something. So getting active in ASTM, getting active in NSF, um, EPA has, a, there's, you know, different initiatives that are going on, various and sundry um, 
green products coalitions that are being developed. Green Blue has doing some stuff on sustainable packaging. So tracking those, that would be a really valuable contribution to help. And that not only do you, do you learn a lot, but you're really informing how we, how we, um, what we're setting as the agenda for green in the future. Mm -hmm. Anybody else on the panel want to respond to that? I would just say on a macro level, um, there's your congressmen and your senators, and there are things that are going on, um, such as um, the lack of energy and climate bills that really are really important. And I, I don't mean to get too political, despite what your views might be on climate or energy, but the, the idea that we're trying to do some global action here and we can't even attend COP meetings, we can't attend the UN and FCCC meetings and have the backing of our own legislative branch really leaves us completely capped at the knees. So it's, there's, there's always those guys. So, <laughs> What about socially responsible investing? I mean, are, are, you mentioned your wallets in terms of buying at the, at the counter, but should we be screening our companies? I mean, th this is a big field these days in terms of oh, what yeah. we invest I mean, you know, in. Yeah, screen your own. It's, it's, it's interesting the things that you can do relative to finding, you know, the environmental performance relative to EPA databases of manufacturing companies. It's, you know, coming back to asking the questions. It's asking mm -hmm. the hard questions, and it doesn't cost any money to do that. The worst that can happen is they can say, I don't know, or I'm not going to tell you. But then that's even informative in itself. Um, not be, and you'd, you have to do a little bit of your own work to say, what are the questions I should be asking for this particular product right. category? Um, you know, getting that knowledge, but asking the questions and, and, and then demanding of the answers, um, you know, with time, I think is really important. And then, so, yeah, social sure. responsible investing, there's efforts that are underway now on real estate where they actually have um, responsible real estate um, investing where they're really trying to get at the, the, the money behind um, real estate, a lot of the REITs, and having them start to analyze buildings and analyze projects for should they be invested in at all. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Good. One more question from the audience. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> I understand that Walmart is starting to get into this whole area and uh, greening their supply chain. I don't know if they're into it enough yet, and have you seen any impact from that? Good question. Anybody? Okay. When? <laughs> when is, uh, they're a member, aren't they? Is they are a member, and we actually okay. have a green supply chain project with them uh -huh. uh, in Guatemala and El Salvador, and um, they're fantastic in the terms that they, they really are devoted to this, and it's, in, it's, it's really endemic in the company. They have made concerted efforts on this in, in a variety of fronts. One is, is that they're, they're local, domestically, they're buying local. And if you go in, into a Walmart, um, I, I, I've never been in one, to be honest, but if you go into <laughs> one... <laughs> I live in We're not going to tell your <laughs> client that. I know. Sorry. Um, but if you go into one, they, their produce, they're focusing on local produce. Um, they are working in supply chains uh, because they can. They know that they, whatever they can do, they will be the leader in it, just like they did with the light bulbs three years ago. Their activities in China are massive. They're working with... Um, uh, about uh, Environmental Defense Fund, um, National Resources Defense Council in China, on specifically on supply chain issues, and um, they're coming out with something that would is really interesting and possibly paradigm shifting, which is the Sustainability Index for su for suppliers, um, and it is scary. Um, the suppliers are all looking at this very closely. Uh, Walmart, um, we actually had the VP of Sustainability talk to um, a group of um, a gathering about four months ago, and he said, we have it so that you can, you can get, your, get engaged, get your diamond ring, go online and see exactly what my, mine it came from. Now, I'm not sure if that's up yet, but that is their goal. And that's not necessarily romantic, but I think it's, <laughs> you know, I think it's um, Walmart is doing this because they just know they can well, here's the six. Uh, I said, well, I used the sixty-four thousand. I guess this is the sixty-five thousand dollars question. Can you really be the cheapest and the best environmentally at the same time? I mean, isn't that bound to drive up the price? Let's just talk about the economics of, of green products for for a moment. And Walmart's, a, I guess, as good an example as any. I think you, you'll probably have more to say about this. But we spent a while talking to Walmart. We did an article on on their 
building their green building program a couple of years ago, and so we spoke with some of their folks. And um, I do want to, first of all, the fact that they're working with, with your organization, Gwen, and across a whole bunch of categories, they've picked the best environmental consultants in the country, and all those consultants say they're taking it seriously. You know, the ones we've talked to, we, they said they're taking it seriously. They're really following up on, on what we're trying to get them to do there. The one area that they, it was almost like they didn't even, it, it's not like they, they, they didn't even know how to address the question was when we asked them about the lo their location choices. They just yeah. could not address, they did not want to talk about where their stores are being, are being built. And that was two years ago now. I don't know if that's changed. It haven't, doesn't appear to have in terms of where they're building now. Um, but, but the whole issue about transportation in terms of people getting to and from their stores was not something, um, you know, they're kind of, in terms of talking to them about town centers and, you know, being able to come to a town center and do multiple errands at once, they said, well, why? You come to our store, you get everything you need, right? Um, Who so needs that's the, the town, town center, center huh? right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, but what about the well, products of the hotel? Can you be yeah, cheap so and so green we, is your question. Yeah. yeah. So to your question, I mean, I, I don't believe that the uh, green and, and low cost are mutually exclusive, and I actually think that they actually are very much aligned. The challenge that we have is in many cases, particularly when we talk about building products, we've got very mature industries. They've, for the most part, stopped investing in NAR and D. Um, they have huge volume, so they're able to spread out their, their costs significantly, and they're a very, very, very low cost provider. But there's nothing really innovative and new going on there. And on the other hand, where you do have a lot of the green products, they're small operations, it's very innovative, they are investing their money, they're using it wisely, and because of that, that's why you have a little bit of, that you have the cost differential. So the challenge is how do we get this, the kind of the old, established, we're stuck, we're mature, you know, we only earn one or two percent, we're, you know, we're flatline when it comes to the stock. How do we get that reinvigorated so its true cost is reflected? At the same point in time, do things from the, from the, from the R&D side that's going to help to reduce that, that cost to market for all the new products. Uh, I think we have to be a lot smarter about how you know, we allow companies to capitalize investment on that side to bring down the perceived market costs of some of that stuff as well. I mean, if you add more fly ash to cement, yeah, maybe you can lower the price and get a better product. But what about the, this whole thing that you, know, you read that in China they're not following certain practices for whether it's mining or dumping the, the, the toxic waste into the into the river instead of having it properly treated. I mean, these things do cost money, and they're going to drive up the price. We can't deny that, that there are certain, certain things about being environmental that are, that are going to cost money. I'm not saying right. that... that I, they're wrong. It's wrong to do that. When, when right, should but do I think them. part of the part of the problem is you say what should be the baseline cost, and in those situations, I would tell you that the the actual environmental costs are not being being properly accounted for to begin with. So therefore, it's, the it's artificially low, right? And if you actually issue. account for it properly, then you start to you know mm -hmm. make that level that level. level, yeah. level We've level been getting off easy yeah. as consumers, frankly. I mean, mo uh, carbon hasn't been monetized. Uh, right. The externalities haven't been accounted for in a cost in cost mm -hmm. accounting. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe, maybe our perception of cheap is uh, a bit skewed, mm -hmm. and we might have to have a little bit of a, you know, uh, facing reality. Right. right. One of my pet peeves that we talk about the whole issue of how solar is so expensive, right, on a, mm -hmm. on a per, per kilowatt basis. And yet, if you look at how much our country has invested in the development of fossil fuel-based technologies mm -hmm. for the last hundred years, what, we've, what we're investing now is... I mean, not even a finger, fingernail thickness of a you know, whole body. I mean, it's, so, so that's part of the challenge that we have is we have this dichotomy that's happened on an economic side that really dwarfs and, and, and masks true cost. The TVA, the big spill that happened in TVA, you know, where, the, where, the, um, where you had all that, that, that slag, I mean, the, the ponds failing, right? That cost is multi-billions of dollars, but it's not going to be reflected in the cost of electricity to the mm -hmm. downstream users. Okay. We're paying for okay. them as taxpayers. No, <laughs> and something you said earlier in your introductory statement, Kirsten, you said, you know, it's not about sacrifice, or I forget the word you used, but, but is that always the case? I mean, can I, can I just go out and buy a 60-inch TV and, and because it has the Energy Star label, feel good about myself? I mean, if we're not sacrificing, it, don't we have to make some sacrifices to, to pay deference to the environment? Well, I think it depends upon what you're defining as sacrifice. If, what you're, if, if you're saying that what we really want people to do is we want them to, to live a lifestyle that really is um, of benefit to the entire society, to all of community, rather than just yourself, um, then maybe there are changes in behavior, changes in choices 
that you're making. Mm -hmm. But is that being austere? I don't think so. I mean, I think part of it is education, making people aware, building a stronger sense of community. So, you know, on the TV thing, yeah. I mean, I think one of, the, one of the big problems you have is what's the performance you're after? And if you really feel that you need to have 60 inches of color slapped on the wall to watch the, you know, the, the Super Bowl, then, okay, here are your choices and get the one that is most... Yeah. The, that's it's the, like, the the can, can the McMansion be a lead certified house, you know, a home? I mean, these are, that's a, yeah. these are big questions. The one, uh, the one silver <laughs> lining on these, on these McMansions that are going green is that if they're going to experiment with new technologies, it's better for the rich people to do that on the homes where they can afford to replace what they need to than, uh, well, than put those in. And it is one of the things Nadav and I have been gap, grappling with this for years on the MR tag. It's like, how do you reward people for using less stuff? Because we don't have the measurement tool. So it's getting at, like, okay, you're not putting carpet down. You're just staining the concrete. So how can you get benefit from that? If you put if you put the carpet down, you might get you know some credit because it has recycled content or something like that. Mm -hmm. But you can't account for our methodologies right now. Don't allow us to account for not doing something. Right. Um, and and so that's it, it, the same thing. You know, using less. Like not having air conditioning. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So talk, we talked about lead. Um, is lead driving this more than any other institutional factor? I mean, what what's driving the the movement as in, into, into greener well, products. Clearly, from the architecture perspective, LEED has done a phenomenal job in building awareness, in you know, getting manufacturers to at least start asking the questions, and it's like, yeah, what flavor of green do you need? And I want them to do the, you know, just be doing the right thing. But at least that's starting to happen. So in, in that sense, it's been wonderful. It also has really helped because before we had a lot of green building rating systems, but what you did in San Francisco was different than Santa Barbara, which was different than Oregon, which was different than Austin. And as designers, we were going nuts, and manufacturers mm -hmm. were also going nuts. So in that sense, coming up with more of a global platform for how we're quantifying green uh, from the building perspective and from the, des from the planning perspective with neighborhood development, it's been very, very influential, I think. It has, it's not flawless. Its ability to right now deal with carbon and, 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 and kind of life cycle is, needs a lot of work, but we've been, it's, but isn't there's that, no easy solution. But isn't the next iteration, yeah. not of, isn't, isn't that what they're saying, that life cycle assessment would be part of? It's coming. Uh, it's coming, coming but how far, how far you, we can get in terms of really getting to a system okay. that does it right? Okay. I mean, that, there's no easy way to do it right. And uh -huh. in order for lead to be manageable for designers, it can't be too, as you pointed out, you know, if you get to this six-dimensional, have to solve this six-dimensional matrix in order to yeah. um, come through, you know, with the right answer, you know, designers are not going to be able to do it. So LEED is always in this place of trying to find, to walk this fine line between technical rigor and something that actually fits into a, a design and construction process that, that people can do. And so, yes, in fact, there's, pilot cred there's a pilot credit out right now that designers can use um, on a voluntary basis to, to, to experiment with this. Have you, have you guys tried that anything yet? Um, not, it doesn't really fit our building type. That's right. It doesn't fit. Yeah. It's but, more for, yeah. yeah a small, um, but, the, but the other thing, too, I think that LEED has done is it's really expanded the, people, the awareness. I mean, it's gone beyond designers. It's gone beyond building owners into the developer community, into the brokerage community, which is huge. So we now have brokers who know what we're talking about when we're talking about, you know, we're looking for energy efficient systems or we want, you know, where are the walk-off mats? I mean, or, you know, what, what, what's... Has, does mm -hmm. a landlord have in place to do commissioning of systems? So that's huge. Yeah. That is really huge because traditionally that's been a, an audience that's all about doing the deal, whatever way. And at least now they have green terms that are in there that are influencing the deal making. The thing, the thing that I'm hearing from a lot of teams is the way that lead provide lead provides the enforcement. It's like there's there's a as, as flawed as it is, there is a checklist, and you have to achieve a threshold to earn the point, and you have to achieve enough points to get your silver, or your mm -hmm. gold, whatever it is you're going after. And so designers who might be doing a, a non-lead building where you know they're trying to do some green stuff, and so they specify some green products, and then it comes down to push comes to shove, and the contractor can't get the stuff easily, or it's going to cost a little more, or it's not available in the right color. Well, it falls right away. If there's a lead point at stake. Somebody is going to go the extra mile. They're going to figure out how to get it. They're going to maybe spend a little extra money. Whatever. They're, they're more likely to make that extra effort because you know there's somebody's counting the beans and the beans have to add up. <laughs> and what about this cradle to cradle certification? We haven't talked about that. Is it gaining traction? I mean, th those folks say that being green isn't good isn't isn't good enough. You know, it's not just be, it's not a matter of being less bad. bad. It's a matter of being truly good which is getting the product into a, into a cycle where it is truly sustainable. 
Well, so you have, I mean, the bleed is for the building, and it's not for the product. Uh, right. And so you do have a growing number of, of certification programs that are available on the product side. Cradle to Cradle is one of them. Level is another one that's come out with um, for furniture, NSF 140 for sustainable carpet assessment standard. So there mm -hmm. are these growing holistic um, certification programs that really help to simplify for the consumer. Is this green or not? Um, in the, some cases, like on the NSF and, and BIFMA standards, those are publicly available standards. They've been vetted through an open process. Everybody knows what the criteria is. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so it kind of meets more the international norms, something like C2C. It's very sophisticated, but it's somewhat black box. C2C so being at, cradle C2C to cradle. being cradle to cradle. But mm -hmm. somewhat to black box. I mean, but very, you know, some good intelligence has gone into it. So, you know, it's, it's it, it, it playing to playing to somewhat different audiences. But clearly it's trying to get at, it, we talk, alluded to that earlier, trying to get at simplifying it for the consumer or the specifier or the designer to give me my green products. So I don't know, I mean, we have spec books that are this thick right now. It's crazy. Um, in part because we've got pages and pages and pages of product detail, environmental details and products. If I can just say for carpet, all you have to do is be NSF 140 gold, and I've taken care of you know, 17 pages of environmental attributes that we need to be worried about. That helps us a lot in the marketplace. I love it. I want to put the PhDs out of business. <laughs> a few more questions, and then we're going to come to some final uh, remarks. Please, ma'am. I heard that Germany's building standards, their codes that they recently enacted, under those codes, our highest lead category will not qualify. So one question I have is how much are you looking to what other countries are doing mm. and are doing better to integrate that information. And then my second concern when it comes to Walmart, Evo Walmart, uh, is it seems as if it's a contradiction that they're going into sustainability when, they've, when they're so responsible for the destruction of local jobs. And that's really, to me, should be part of sustainability. And when they're paying a dollar an hour and there are no health and safety regulations, how can a product under those circumstances be considered sustainable? Anybody? So I can address the German thing. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, they've, the Europeans have always been ahead of us, and they continue. And, and, but they have such great history. We should just look at them. They know how to design communities. It's like, duh, not rocket science. You can look and see, how do we design Paris? How do we design Florence? It works. Um, but in Germany, the particular one thing that they have is that they require access to daylight. And in LEED, it's optional. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we have to you know, seriously think about when we're designing our buildings. They, they're a much narrower floor plate. They ch significantly change the configuration of buildings. Um, but Germany has said it's mandatory. People, when they're working, have to have access to daylight. Um, so I think, and I, I'm all for it. We design, we push, we work really hard to get a lot of daylight. Um, but the problem is, again, when you have a big floor plate that's original design. Um, and, you know, the Walmart and the jobs issue, that's a real challenge. And I think, you know, one of the, we're seeing more and more where no longer are um, our communities allowing, there was a, a big push again, this is in California, um, in Petaluma, where Walmart wanted to come in. And they said, oh, we're going to be creating all these extra jobs. Well, they found that they weren't creating all this, extra, uh, and tax revenue. Well, they weren't. They were basically um, stealing it from the existing downtown. And the city said, can't do. Because we, you know, when they actually drilled through and said, where is all this tax revenue coming from? There's not a whole lot of growth consumer base. All you're doing is moving it from downtown, which is much better jobs, providing for a more vibrant community. And so, sorry, but it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. I'll speak to that as well, just yeah, real quickly. Please. Um, I agree. And I, and I think um, if you look at any of the major companies, multinationals, that are affecting change, either by creating greener products or creating um, better labor standards or, or whatever they're doing, there's always, because they're the largest companies in the world, there's always going to be something that, is, that still needs to be worked on and still needs to be improved. Um, and there are great activist organizations out there uh, that are pushing for those, and they should still push for them. Just because these companies are doing really good work on the forefront of one aspect doesn't mean that they, they should they need to rest on those laurels for uh, other issues that um, that can it would behoove them to improve. Um, but that also shouldn't take away from some of the good work that a lot of the companies are doing. It's always going to be a push and pull like that. And there are um, and 
you're absolutely right to bring attention to it because the, you, you can't just say bravo to company X for having done something good. Now they can slide on everything else. You always have to be aware. And, you know, it's just like balancing out. What do you put in, the sustain, in, in measuring a sustainable project? You, uh, you know, personally, yeah, I think you should include um, what you do to livelihoods. I'm sure we could spend another 10 hours talking about Walmart because it is a very complex. <laughs> One more question, and then we'll go back to the panel. Yes, sir. Um, I had a question. As our society moves uh, more and more into, as, towards becoming a more sustainable society, um, do people lose sight of the fact that the new products, even as green as they are, still have a, a base energy cost in terms of their manufacture? Whereas, you know, I live in, a, I live in an old drafty house, so say I want to be super green, so I'm going to tear the whole thing down and build, you know, lead platinum home. Clearly the net, you know, the net energy is going to be, you know, my house is now much more effective, but I clearly wasted a lot of energy building this whole new house. Um, so I was wondering, addressing that both from the, the social perspective of, you know, the drive to go green as fast as possible um, and, you know, the, the consequences of that in terms of, you know, wasting good products that we have now, as well as on a smaller scale, such as the TV that you mentioned, you know, buying an Energy, energy Star TV is great, you know, if it uses a lot less power than the TV I have now, but at the same time, while I'm saving that power, I'm still essentially wasting a TV, and this new one has you know, probably a lot more energy than I would save going into the manufacture of it. And from a, con <clears throat> sorry, from a consumer's point of view, I consider myself fairly eco-conscious, but I have no way of knowing the, the exact amount of energy that I'm going to be saving, yeah. you know, replacing something that I have with something that's more energy efficient. Well, that was the criticism, at least one criticism, of the cash for uh, clunker program, right? You, you, you give in your old car for a more efficient one, but then you're, you're having another car be... Uh, having, all, extracting all the material. It was good for the economy. Okay, so who, who would like to address this? Anybody? So um, I, I'm a big proponent for existing buildings, just let me to start there. And so I think, you know, that's, um, and we are actually looking at kind of trying to do a life cycle assessment program for buildings to really figure out when you consider the, oper the materials that went into it they are, and the operations and end of life, what really are the footprint. My thing is, you know, live in the drafty building, but, you know, don't expect to condition it from 68 to 72 degrees. Um, you know, wear a few sweaters. Do, and, you know, do some smart things that you can cock up. You can, you know, fill the holes where you, where you want to. I mean, I think that it's, it's being practical. It's being frugal. Um, it's, you know, using materials wisely. And tearing something down to building the new is not necessarily the wisest use of materials. Um, to let you know, our solution to the TV thing, um, we did have a one big old Mondo TV. My husband was a big TV fan, and it died. Yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we no longer have a TV. What we do is we use our computers, and what we have is a projector. And when we want to watch a film, we project on the wall. Um, and so we have a big, we have a multi-use device because we can take it out when we're speaking. My husband does a lot of Boy Scout stuff, and so it goes on the road. But it's a very practical thing at home. Very, very energy efficient compared to any of the other mm -hmm. uh, devices. Um, and they're now getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So you know, it's it's finding those solutions that work for you. Um, under, but again, it's understanding all the different ramifications. I think it's really there important. There you go. Okay, we're but, coming to the end. So I just want to put one or two questions to to all of you. Um, we're in Washington, so the uh, sort of the obvious question that comes to mind at the end is, well, what, what, what should we go tell the, these folks across the street um, if, we, if we had an audience with them? You know, you go to Congress or go to the president. What, what can we do as, in Washington to, to make this a better world? Start making some decisions. Mm -hmm. um, Start making some decisions. <laughs> so, it. well, um, you know, Gwen alluded to it earlier. I think the whole issue on carbon is really important, that we really need to, I mean, how can, we've so lost our leadership position on, on pretty much anything in the world, but particularly on the environment. Um, and we need, if you've got Walmart saying it's a problem, hello, <laughs> we think that we could have a number of other people say, okay, we think uh, that we need to do something about this. I think that's um, clearly number one. And number two, the whole issue, I do think that we have to get our arms around the issue of toxicity. Um, mm -hmm. in all products. And it's as much in vinyl purses as it is in, um, you know, materials that are used in construction. Uh -huh. and, um, and, and invest more in really understanding that, potentially looking at what they're already doing in Europe from the REACH program, the Rojas program, build and bringing more of that in. But those are the two things that I think we have. Um, we're getting a handle on energy cons conservation, on water, um, and even on materials optimization, but the issues of carbon and the issues of toxicity are, are need, need, definitely need help from um, our friends on the Hill. Adopt. What are you going to tell the president? Um, well, I was going to actually 
applaud some of the things that are starting to come out. There was just, wasn't there just this week or last week a bill introduced that changes the way chemicals are regulated? It starts to get away from, traditionally, right, the, the standard has been that any chemicals are presumed safe until, until, they're there's, right. until there's an indication of, of hazard. And um, I don't, I'm not up on all the details of it, but I did see something about there being a bill just having introduced that tries to change that around. Mm -hmm. um, the, the current issue of, of environmental building news is actually called Chemistry for Designers, about getting into this, how do you start to look at toxic and materials, and it, and it talks about that a little bit. Um, and I've got some copies of it here if um, people want to want to grab one and see in more detail what we said about, about that kind of thing. So I think that, um, yeah, I'm with you. Um, um, the whole the carbon thing. I mean, the the more direct action that, that we started talking about is just getting away from coal, and um, and so it's part of the carbon solution. And I think it's it's one that's the piece of the energy puzzle that we haven't really haven't addressed. There you go. So really pushing on that one. When? I think I'd reiterate what I said earlier. We need to. I would say stick a stake in the ground on climate legislation um, because really the, this issue is an international issue, and we we need street cred when we're talking to. Europe, the, to the EU, and to Brazil, and India, and China, um, and, you know, at, at this point, just give us something to go with. Good. Well, I think our time is up, so I want to thank the panelists. You've done a great job. I think we have, if not changed the world, we've certainly had a good conversation this evening. Thanks you all for coming. Uh,